Hello, this video is on dating the Gospel of Mark. Let me share my screen. Okay, the Gospel of Mark. From the very beginning, people have attributed this gospel to uh, having been written by John Mark. It doesn't say that inside the gospel. All four gospels actually inside are anonymous, but they're all clearly attributed to somebody, and it's been assigned to Mark from the beginning. The early church fathers had a lot to say about how it was written, too. I've provided a list here of some of the early church fathers who assigned the gospel to Mark, but also said that it came as a result of the preaching of Peter. Now, John Mark uh, had a home there in Jerusalem, and Peter was a leader of the early church, one of the leaders in Jerusalem for some good while. And so you can imagine they probably knew each other and there was a good connection there. So all of these early church fathers indicate that uh, the material from Mark is really originally mostly from Peter. A couple of these early church fathers are pretty early, like Irenaeus and Papias. Papias, I think, being born still in the first century AD. Also, several of them that I've listed there indicate that the gospel was written in Rome. Uh, when Mark went to Rome uh, in the latter part of the 60s AD. So, that's what the early church fathers say. Whatever the early church fathers say is not necessarily always correct, although there's a lot of them that gave witness to it. Can we look at the gospel itself and see if there's anything specific that seems to connect it to Peter? Well, I think there is. Like in the resurrection story in Mark, it says, but go, the angel is telling the, the women, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee. The other gospels don't call out Peter by name there. And then the transfiguration, you get a little bit of thinking not only of what Peter said, but what Peter was actually thinking. It said, Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he didn't know what to say, for they were terrified. So kind of the witness there is Peter didn't really even know what to say, so he just said something anyway. As far as the connection to Rome, there's pretty good reason to connect it to Rome as well. Uh, the epistles of Paul have a few things to say there that let you know that Mark uh, Mark was, was there in, in Rome with Paul for part of the time. Here in Colossians 4, it says, Mark is one of the ones who greets you in Colossians being written from Rome. Like also 2 Timothy, here it says, Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he's very useful to me for ministry. So in that case, Mark isn't in Rome, but Paul is asking that he come to Rome. And also in Philemon, written from Rome, Paul is sending his final greetings and says, Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers also greet you. So Mark did go to Rome. And then there's this... Uh, connection to Rome. In Mark 15, when Jesus is going to be crucified, they compel a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, to carry the cross, and they say in Mark, he's the father of Alexander and Rufus. Now, it's unusual to note who the sons were when you mention somebody's life. Sometimes you say who the father was, but you don't usually say who the sons were. So it's curious that it would say Simon of Cyrene was the father of Alexander and Rufus. The other gospels don't say that. But Rufus apparently was somebody who lived in Rome based on Romans 16 when Paul wrote a letter to them. So perhaps the reason that Mark put this thing about he's the father of Alexander and Rufus is maybe the Romans knew Rufus so they could identify with Simon of Cyrene, his father. Maybe they knew Alexander too, but we just don't know about that. And then look at this uh, description here. Um, in Mark 7, the Pharisees gather and uh, 
some of Jesus' disciples are eating with unwashed hands. And then in verse three and four, it says, for the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly and so on. And what it's doing here is it's describing Jewish customs. Well, if it's describing Jewish customs, what that's telling you is that wasn't written by Mark when he was in Jerusalem, because that'd be silly to write a passage describing Jewish customs, because everybody's Jewish and they all know their Jewish customs. So what it tells you is that this book was written to an audience which Mark thought would be largely not Jewish. And you can take it a little bit farther than that. And it's because of the Aramaisms in Mark. Sometimes in Mark, it records what a name was or what Jesus said, and it leaves the Aramaic in there. There's an Aramaic line like this one that says, Jesus was taking her by the hand and he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, Little girl, I say to you, arise. Well, the thing is, Talitha Kumi is Aramaic, and everybody in Jerusalem would have been able to understand that without it having to be translated. And not just in the land of Israel, but also in uh, Syria. You know, there was an early church in Antioch. They would have spoken Aramaic, and most of the people in Asia Minor would have spoken Aramaic. So the fact that he has Aramaic phrases and he doesn't just let them stand. Every time there's an Aramaic phrase, Mark provides a translation. That indicates that he's writing to an audience which doesn't speak Aramaic. So it's not even a Middle Eastern audience. He's writing to a European audience, probably Roman. Uh, he said, Abba, Father. We're sort of used to Christians using that phrase, Abba, Father, but really that's a translation. Abba means Father, so Mark is translating it. And the longest one, Jesus on the cross cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So again, translated. Also, Ephatha, Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder. All of those are Aramaisms, which are translated for the benefit of the readers. Here's an argument that I have read, by the way, I was about to include it. I dug into it a little more and I've decided it's not a particularly good argument. So just in case you hear it, there are Latinisms in Mark too. That is words which are really Latin, like denarius and praetorium and quadrans. Um, However, and they're not translated, and the, the, the argument given was because the Roman audience would already know those. But the problem with that is those words appear in all the other Gospels, too. And the things they describe, like denarius, it's a coin, it's likely to be words that were commonly used everywhere. So I don't think the presence of a few Latin words in Mark is a strong argument. And as long as we're talking about not strong arguments, you may, if anybody has followed things around on the internet or something, seen an argument that Dead Sea Scrolls 7Q5 is really a fragment with a little bit of the Gospel of Mark. And I don't think that that's correct. You can almost judge from this picture that this is gonna be an inherently weak argument because this is all there is of Scrolls 7Q5. The letters are in Greek. Uh, there's not enough there to make a compelling case that this would really be from the Gospel of Mark. And you wouldn't expect a Dead Sea Scroll to have anything from Mark. The Essene community, which kept those scrolls, they weren't Christians anyway. And um, most of those scrolls were written really before Jesus. There were some that were a little bit later, but so you wouldn't really expect them to have the Gospel of Mark in the Dead Sea Scrolls. On all of the Gospels, I'm going to say something about the destruction of Jerusalem because the absence of any foreshadowing or anything like that about the destruction of Jerusalem is really an argument that they were written before the destruction of Jerusalem. The only thing that is held to counter against that is that in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus predicts the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, the gospels never say that it was fulfilled or anything like that, so they never do a victory dance to indicate that this prophecy was fulfilled. So, I, I don't think that the fact that Jesus predicted it indicates that the gospel was written afterwards. And in Mark, the case is even a little bit different. 
because in Mark, this is all you've got that's really specific about the destruction of Jerusalem. Jesus says in verse two, do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. So as far as the destruction of the city, that is, that is not much. And there are even some uh, critics who don't mind putting Mark before 70 AD because Jesus's prediction there is not very specific about Jerusalem. Mark has less on this than Matthew and Luke, and he is less specific. I had the same slide in there when I did the video on Luke, because the Sadducees come and say in the present tense that there is no resurrection. But after the destruction of Jerusalem, the Sadducees faction effectively did not survive that. So when Mark says in present tense, it indicates that the Sadducees are still a going concern when he writes his gospel. Now, persecution. Mark has a lot to say about persecution. It has the most detailed description of the death of John the Baptist, who loses his head because he's doing the right thing, but he just runs up against an evil king. Um, there's multiple warnings about Jesus' arrest and death. Jesus tells him three times that that's going to happen. But especially in the Gospel of Mark, the disciples never get it. They're, they're difficult. They're, they're clueless about a lot of things, and especially about when Jesus says that this is going to happen to him. Um, they, they don't seem to accept that. And in fact, one time, Peter objects and Jesus has to say, get behind me, Satan, it's really sharp. So the, the disciples have a hard time understanding that anything is going to happen like that, especially with anything having to do with persecution. Judas betrays him, Peter denies him, everybody runs away, including a young man in a linen cloth who runs away naked in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I think that that's probably the, uh, the verse which is in there about that young man running away is not in Matthew and Luke. I believe that's probably John Mark when he, he was probably the young man who lived there in Jerusalem. The Last Supper might have been in his house even perhaps, and he might have followed the group out to the Garden of Gethsemane, but he runs away too. It's Mark's way of saying, I was actually there for part of this. So if Mark was written early, in the phase of Roman persecution, shortly after the great Roman fire that Emperor Nero blamed on the Christians, he may have been making a point to the readers there that Christians have to be prepared for the possibility of persecution and that they need to respond in a certain way. Although Mark has less of Jesus' sayings by far than the other gospels, uh, Mark has a, a good deal of narrative about what happens, but in terms of red letter words, what Jesus says, he's got quite a bit less. When Mark talks about persecution, it's pretty full. Like in this passage in Mark 13, he says, be on your guard for they will deliver you over to councils and you will be beaten in synagogues and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you were to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved." So Mark has a lot to say about persecution and how disciples ought to bear up under persecution. And with that in mind, let's say something about the ending of the Gospel of Mark. You can read some uh, authors who will suggest that the ending of the Gospel of Mark was actually lost. And, and you know, in Mark chapter 16, that's the last chapter. And the first eight verses are agreed, but verses nine through 20, which will show up in some versions of the Bible, but they usually have a note that said, this passage is not in the best and most ancient uh, endings to Mark, and it's not. Most people don't really consider that, those, that to be a good canonical passage. But 
Having only eight verses after the resurrection seems pretty short, and so some people have suggested that there's probably more and that it's been lost. But let me make a different suggestion here. Consider the way Mark ends in the ears of a church which has just begun to experience persecution. So say that this really is the end, the end of the gospel. How does it end? It says, the angel is speaking to the women. It says, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. So how would that ring in the ear of a church which has just begun to experience persecution? They're commanded to go and tell, and they say nothing to anyone because they were afraid. I think that that would be an exhortation to the believers there in Rome to continue to be bold in their witness for the Lord. So in my mind, I think that really is the ending of Mark as far as the gospel was delivered to the Romans there. So the conclusion I have is that Mark was written in the 65 to 68 AD timeframe by John Mark in Rome at such time when the church had just begun to truly experience persecution from the Romans. This was the very beginning of that period of Roman persecution. In a later video, I'm gonna talk about why this Roman version of Mark was not the first version of this gospel. I mentioned that previously in another video that I, I believe Mark probably took his first effort at writing the gospel long before this and probably made a number of copies of his and that this version was actually one that was developed especially for the Romans. And so that when Luke, uh, which was actually written, I believe earlier, like about 60 AD, Luke, I think, used Mark as one of his sources, but Luke was using an earlier version of Mark than the Roman version. And that takes a little bit of explaining to do, so I'm going to cover that in another video. So thank you for watching this one, and I hope to be back soon with another video.